Okay. What I thought I would do this evening um, is uh, read from um, like the three published books and, and the forthcoming book, the movie poems that I've written because it turns out, well, it's not true. I didn't write a movie poem for the first book. I thought I had, but I hadn't. But for the second book and the, and the third book and the fourth book, I, I, there are movie poems in all of them. So I thought that's what I would do. Um, the first one, and I, when, I, when I read this, when I used to read this, I would say, if there's anyone in the audience that can identify and name uh, the titles, or at least the director, of uh, the three major films that I reference in this, you get a free copy of the book. <clears throat> I don't know that I have that many copies of that book here, so I hope most of you can't get this. Okay. Up a film. File back up the aisle of the cinema, walk out into the street, preferably alone, the sheen of neon streaking rain wet asphalt, post war Prague. Or is it Vienna, Warsaw, New York? Enter a cafe or bar, clasp a mug in your hands, cold meeting heat and the silk of liquid. Window mirrored, sleek, shark bellied cars flash by every third the carrier of a possible assassin. The echo of footsteps in the fog reverberate beneath your feet. A flute's atonal tone reverberate beneath your feet, other feet running fast through crisscrossing chambers, tunnels, a subterranean maze. A match is struck. And for a moment, a single eye peers out of the darkness, a look loosened with fear. Hunch shouldered, you shrug back into your coat, body hot, blood heavy, alive. Um, in that, so that was, I think, from Aid Memoir, and in that same uh, book is a poem in response to one of my favorite uh, movies, the Jean Renoir uh, movie, La Grande Illusion. In my mind's eye, a carambolage of images, though it's years since you and I saw Jean Gabin play the common soldier, wounded, running with a confrere over open land, the striven for a border buried under layers of ice-crusted snow. With each step, the two men sink thigh deep, but struggle on like a span of oxen slogging through mire. A matter of preference. The cavalier French officer piping a tune on his fife while he executes a diversionary dance over the prison's parapets, or the monocled precision of von Stroheim pulling white gloves over seared hands before bowing his body, braced from waist to chin, then snapping it back to toss down a schnapps. Cataracts on the mind, so many, all vying for the rank of grand honor as in military code of faith in a cause worth dying for. On good days, I incline towards love, the mirage we once pursued. Leaning over tables spread with maps, generals on both sides, four and five starred plot a war. Did they truly think it would be fought by gentlemen playing by la règle du jeu? And this, I think, is yes, is also from Aid Memoir. Conversations with Other Women. That is the title of a movie. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie. No? Okay. It's a good movie. That old Andy Warhol trick with the split screen, except his screens were sometimes split six ways. I can't remember how many frames it took to show the hedonistic Adonis naked to the waist go on and on about the feel of his long blonde locks brushing the nape of his neck. What is it with movies you never forget that draw you in and are more than spectacle? Afterwards, walking out, you are young and beautiful and enmeshed in a tragic love with someone young and beautiful who wants you, but oceans, accidents, marriages have come between, so there's only this one long stolen night in a hotel room, of course, neither posh nor shabby, and you talk and talk 
and eventually make love as you once did in a golden past and where you both were younger and even more beautiful. And there's nothing for it, but yet more talk and deep kisses and a shower and a message on the hotel room phone and your cell phones getting mixed up. And then shortly after dawn, a taxi ride for you to Kennedy. It turns out you've been in New York City all along. And for him, the split now final, a short ride across town to a breakfast date with one of the betrayed. Oh, oh. <laughs> and now, uh, surely some of you have seen Blow Up. OK, all right. So this one is entitled Blow Up. The front window of this Tim Hortons, backlit and triptyched, is so clear I feel I'm looking at an enlarged photograph, a mammoth Jeff Wall maybe, of a swath of lawn in a park with trees, leaves turning, and I'm back in London, the London of Antonioni, and the many times I returned to the New Haven Cinema to view the film again, bent on resolving whether in one corner of the park the grass had been pressed down by a dead body or by two live bodies having sex. But no, that couldn't be it, since in the movie one, for me, unforgettable sex scene, Sarah Miles lies under a thrusting body on the floor of some squatted house and looks up, rolling her eyes, eyes and mouthing to a stranger walking by, I can't wait for this to be over. A pantomime like the tennis played without ball or rackets by white-faced mimes on a court in that same park, emptiness and ennui, I think now, some 40 years later, that clarity most likely the point of the film. Um, I go to the Toronto, fortunate to live in Toronto that allows me to do this, I go to the the, the Toronto International Film Festival have done so since I moved there when it was only the Festival of Festivals in 1980. And this last year, I saw 28 in the in the um, 10 days, but uh, one year I saw 33, and so that was my personal best, and it's downhill since then. So this is sort of trying to capture what it was like the year that I saw the 33 films in 10 days. Wild grass growing in the tarmac's cracks, insects crawl over petals lucent with sun, entwined bodies move, moan. A man stands on a platform as a train speeds away over tracks meeting at the horizon. The door at the end of a hall closes. Beneath a village's pious surface, a cruel discipline twists the wills of children. And over the glorious summer of 39, the dead mount as evil accretes. Finding a wallet leads to a prop plane plummeting from the sky, and a pianist plays Bach with a clarity and exactitude that breaks the heart. While a dancer in training strengthens his body by bounding upstairs two at a time, bags of cement weighting his legs. And Clive Owen appears on stage before a screening flanked by two boys. The seven-year-old will steal the show. And in a cell hidden in a Haitian citadel, henchmen torture a prisoner, the camera scanning a tray of sinister tools, waterboarding, escalating to a necklace thing some of us can't stomach, refuse to watch, though later delight in the whimsical revenge exacted on the fat cat arms manufacturers and Janae's non-stop shenanigans. And at the last film, on the last night, a packed house bursts into applause when Victoria and Albert's lips first meet, and by then, we wish the festival would go on forever. Our minds replaying the other first kiss between tubular Keats and flirtatious, bespitten Fanny Braun, and leaving the theater night after night in a press of nattering filmgoers floating. Um, I'm, I'm going to read uh, a poem that um, is not a happy poem. Um, I was very fortunate as uh, a beginning graduate student in history to take a course from Theodore Retke at the University of Washington in the year uh, before he died. 
And um, it is In a Dark Time, the title of the poem, that uh, I loved then and have continued to, to love uh, you know, all, my, all my life. And it gave me courage to do something that um, has been in the news recently when, when Robin Williams died. Suddenly, uh, the, the depression of you know, someone who was really famous and really gifted and so on brought others forward um, to say that this is a very common problem that affects lots of people. And it's something that makes many of us uh, ashamed. Um, so I'm going to read a poem that is about my wrestling with uh, bouts of depression. Not fog or wasteland. What name should I give you, you who have shadowed me all my life? Shadow of myself, self, or ombre, l'ombre? Schatten, does language matter? The proximity of mater to matter, a rubiat prayer. Hear the beads click carbon, the mother of all matter. Once I named you rainforest, picturing trees necklaced in clammy moss. Once I named you it, a preposition without antecedent, unsignified. Once Thelma exclaimed, Ruth, you are the most self-punishing person I know. So, my name, which was also my mother's name, is perchance your name, Ruth. Not fog or wasteland, though listen to the long, umlauted vowel of Erde, German for both desert and desolate. Erde, if not your name, surely your sound. And um, how am I doing? <laughs> I meant it, like in terms of time. Anyway, um, uh, uh, this is this is this is a, a poem from the book that is coming up, and it's entitled "Descent." And some of us have been where are we flying recently? So some of us have had this experience recently. Descent. We're flying above a vast cloud plain like an expanse of snow-draped Mongolian steppes, or a giant tablet of white clay, long-legged ibises once tracked with their three-toed feet, cross-hatching a cuneiform chronicle of expulsion and migration, ignominious victory and unthinkable defeat. The script too indistinct to decipher before the slashed zigzags and geometric forms begin to vanish dispersed by our descent into a deceptively solid thickness turning wraith-like as our plane sinks deeper and deeper until we break free on the other side and see the lights on the strip of tarmac we race toward as though chased by the threat of dissolution, particle uncoupled from particle, atom from atom. Um, and just to say that I also write poems with a sort of lighter note. This is one entitled Agapanthus Blue Triumphator, which is the name of a flower. With a name like that, I could do almost anything. Lose my chastity to three men in one night. Write a new and better poem about a red wheelbarrow. Make three beds and not sleep in a single one. Play Kris Kringle at the annual Christmas party. Win a hissing contest with my bad-tempered cat. Delivered a treatise on sin to his holiness. Successfully sue the CEOs of Goldman Sachs. Peel back the layers of an onion without shedding a tear. Become president of the Brotherhood of Inveterate Curmudgeons. Build a chain of dungeons for those guilty of grammatical and syntactical errors. Solve the case of who killed Red Robin. Learn the difference between a gong and a bell, a tongue and a clapper. Um, and then um, I've been staying my good fortune with my friend um, Jacqueline Bourke, and we met um, at a writing retreat in Chile uh, called Los Pacanales, outside of Santiago. And I wrote this poem not the time we were there, but uh, the next time I went, and it's called The Last Day. 
I wake in darkness, Reise fieber, the Germans call it, to the racket of querulous Keltiwi and the competitive pro and response of roosters one parcella to the next. Travel fever. Small talk and sociability spend its time to go home. As the dark recedes, I leave the villa, take the path along the vineyard's western flank through the eucalyptus allee, towards the hill, guardy on at my heels. I thread my way up the slope between spiny bushes, espy a rock to sit on, but Guardian beats me to it and showers it with piss. I choose another. Yolk yellow puffballs hang dust covered from the unbarbed espino like limp balloons the morning after. I've made it up to see the sun rise one more time from behind the Andes, a molten disc ringed and pulsing nimbi. It is is it morning mist or smog that lies in thick bands of haze over Santiago? I gaze down at a world loosely laid out in fields of green and brown, flowering weeds mistakable for dandelions, the moo of a distant cow like a giant mosquito. Still winded from the climb, I begin the descent, Guardian now in the lead as though I don't know the way. Chicory blooms along the canal, a chalky lapis blue. What I don't know is whether I'll ever return. So I'm just going to end with, um, I've just most recently brought out a little chapbook that has 10 poems in it, each dedicated to a photograph by the great Czech photographer, um, Josef Zudek. Some of you may have seen this exhibit. It was on exhibit at the AGO through the fall of 2012 and most of the spring of 2013. And an astound he's an astounding uh, photographer. Anyway, this is one entitled, and this is in a voice quite different from um, the voice that I've used in most of my other writing. This one is, is entitled Hope. What in the egg draws his eye? A design more perfect than a brancusi or an arp? Its hard fragility? Its thin skin strength? Zudex placed the egg on a square field of cloth, and that on another, and then another. A recession of square fields all framing a singular egg. The squares of fabric reiterating the shell's faint marbling, its shaded underside spreading into shadow. An encounter between straight line and curve, between geometry and nature, between the defenseless and the blameless, the innocent and their defenders. Okay. Thank you.